Thank you for joining us at Community On Demand. Today's message is presented by Dan Greer. Dan holds a doctorate from Grace School of Theology and is the senior pastor here at Community Church. This message was recorded during a live Sunday morning service at Community. Let's listen in as Dan begins. On so January 20th, 1961, John F. Kennedy delivered the presidential uh, uh, inaugural address after one of the narrowest presidential elections in American history at that time. Uh, in the audience, you may not realize this, but in the audience that day was President Dwight Eisenhower, President Truman uh, uh, Truman, Harry Truman, um, President, uh, Vice President-elect and soon-to-be President Lyndon Johnson, and outgoing uh, Vice President and soon-to-be President Richard Nixon. These guys were in the audience that day as he was given his inaugural address. Um, Kennedy was the youngest man to ever be elected to the presidential office of the United States of America. And in this particular inaugural address, he gave the shortest presidential inaugural address of all time. It lasted for, are you ready for this? For 14 minutes. Oh, that that could happen again. <laughs> but in those 14 minutes, he made some dynamic statements and quotes that we still remember today. Let me, let me just read some of them to you. This is the one that I like the, uh, the most. He said, let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. This much we pledge and more. Woo, I'd like to hear that again, wouldn't you? Here's the one that, that, we, that we remember him saying. My fellow Americans, you ready? You can probably quote this with me. Ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. But he didn't stop there. He went on to say, my fellow citizens of the world, Ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of, of man. Boy, that's inspirational leadership, rallying people to unify and get together and do something good, not divide and fight. On May the 17th, 1961, four months after his inaugural address, he goes to the Canada, Canadian Parliament and in this speech, he said the following. As the great parliamentarian Edmund Burke said, the only thing necessary for, triumph, for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And that is why we're here today. Oh, man, I'd love for someone to get up and excite me with these kinds of words and some kind of a... a a, a political speech. Oh, I'd love to hear that kind of stuff. As the 35th president uh, of the United States, Kennedy understood that evil existed in the world and that as the leader of the free world, he felt that it was his job to stand up, speak out, and confront evil. His stand against evil put a target on his back. And on that fateful day of November the 22nd, 1963, I remember as a junior high kid and the teacher coming on to the speaker and announcing what had just happened, evil hit its target and took out this particular leader in Daly Plaza, uh, north of us in Dallas, Texas. As a leader, I realize that evil exists in the world. And, and I realize this, that it takes strong, godly leaders to counter evil. 
I believe what he said. Evil will triumph if good men do nothing. I've also realized something else. That when I try to stand up, speak out, and confront evil, I personally stand in the line of fire. I don't like that. In fact, in the, in the past few weeks, there have been several people that have come to me and they said, Dan, there's a target on your back. <laughs> the price we pay for stepping into leadership roles is that we become targeted by evil and misguided people. That is just a fact. The price... Uh, sometimes we struggle to tolerate and endure the constant hits that we receive when we just try to step into leadership. We, we, we struggle to, to, to endure the constant hits as evil people try to break us, burn us, and beat us down. And at the same time, we find ourselves getting misquoted, misunderstood, and misrepresented by the misguided. So we, we got it coming in both directions. Evil people, misguided people. Do you realize this is probably why there is a shortage of leadership in our country, in our community, and yes, even in our churches? We have a vacuum of leadership in our culture right now. And it, 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 we, we really need leaders to stand up even when they're taken on fire. You know, as long as Nehemiah was over in Persia and he was tasting wine and serving wine to the king and under the king's protection, life was wonderful. It was, it was, it was so easy. However, when he stepped into a leadership into the leadership role of rallying the people to restore, repair, and rebuild the wall and restore the city of Jerusalem, he was targeted and came under attack. Let me ask you a question. Why do you think Satan was so interested in targeting and taking Nehemiah out? Have you ever thought of that? Why would Satan be be interested at all at this guy that was over in Persia coming over here and rallying a bunch of ragtime Israelites to build a wall around a town. Why do you think that he would be so motivated and so charged up to take this leader out? I'm going to answer that for you. You ready for this? Satan reads the Bible. And I think he believes a lot of what the Bible said. And as he is reading Daniel chapter, chapter 9 and verse 25, and he begins to see, in 69 weeks after the wall is built and the city is restored, the Messiah is going to come. And Satan said, no way, Jose. They're not going to build a wall. They're not going to restore the city if I have anything to do with it. Because the last thing I want is for Jesus Christ to be coming and redeeming men of their sin. Do you see how it goes? Nehemiah? Didn't realize that, but Satan did. So in Nehemiah chapter 6, that's where we are today, Nehemiah is going to discover four tactics that evil people use, inspired by Satan, that targets leaders. In Nehemiah chapter 6, we're going to find that those tactics are to distract, defame, demoralize, and divide leaders and leadership teams. That's what you get for stepping into leadership. And so let's jump into it. Uh, look, look at Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse number 1. The, the first thing that, that evil people tried to do was distract him. Let's read. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the, uh, the Arab, and the rest of his enemies heard uh, that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, though at that time I had not hung the doors and the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, 
let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. Now, the village of Ono were about 30 miles north of Jerusalem, um, uh, on the northwest side, uh, kind of by the Samaritan border there. And it's kind of in the territory of the sand ballad. So this tactic, understand, this tactic wasn't really just to help Nehemiah negotiate Nehemiah. It was a strategy to pull Nehemiah away from the mission. He's focused. He's building the wall. He's going to restore the city. And, he, and, and so Sanballat says, let's distract him. Hopefully, what we can do is we can distract him, pulling him away, and possibly detain him so that he can't be on mission. Sound familiar out there? This building program was on the brink of completion. The walls were completed to the height of almost 40 feet high. The only thing left was hanging the gates. They had not been installed. They were almost there. Look down the, at, at verse number four uh, there. It says, they talk about San Ballad and these guys. They sent me this message four times. Come on, man. Come on. Let's meet together. Come on. You've got to understand this. We've all got to understand distraction is one of Satan's greatest tactics slash weapons. These enemies were determined that if they could just distract him by pulling him away from the project and into a meeting or a conference, they could stop the mission. Do you know what one of my worst enemies is? Distraction. Satan wants to pull me away from the mission. He wants to pull you away from the mission and, and keep the mission from moving forward. So distraction is the first tactic. The second tactic is that they tried to defame him. Verse 5. Then sent Malad sent his servants to me as before the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. And it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Gisham says, that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall that you may be their king. And you have also appointed prophets to proclaim uh, concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, there's a king in Judah. Now, these matters will be reported to the king. So come, therefore, and let us consult together. Here, Sanballat says, I've got evidence and a testimonial from this guy over here that you've got some issues, Mr. Nehemiah. In fact, it is reported and it's greatly understood that what you're trying to do is not build a wall. You're trying to build your own little kingdom. You want to be king. You want to rebel against the king. He used uh, uh, the word you over and over and over uh, uh, filling people's ears with false reports hoaxes that he's planning to have an insurrection sound familiar rings a familiar there Ronald Reagan once said the nine most terrifying words in the English language are I'm from the government and I'm here to help. San Ballard is saying, I'm here to help. You see, what he's doing here is he's creating a problem that he's going to come back and solve. He's saying, I'm not openly accusing you, Nehemiah. I'm just implicating something that's wrong. And there's a testimony over here, by the way. There's evidence that implies that you've got something wrong and your leadership style, and, and uh, that you're really, you know, your motives are wrong, you're, you're, you're building it up. So let's clear it up. Let's clear it up. Let's get together and clear it up. I'm here to help. So, so these guys, they, they try to distract him, they try to defame him subtly, then they try to demoralize him. Let's keep on reading. Verse number 10. Afterward, I came to the house of Shemaiah, 
and said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us close the doors of the temple for they are coming to kill you. Indeed, at night they're coming to kill you. Simeiah was a close friend of Nehemiah and he was a priest that is going to begin to prophesy something. And in this prophecy, he is going to predict that someone is going to come and not only target, but kill. They're going to attempt to assassinate Nehemiah. And he's saying, here's the solution. Let's go hide. Let's flee. Let's be afraid. Let's go into the temple and lock it up because that is sanctuary. That is a, uh, that is a place of sanctuary. Historically, if you go back and look at the history of Israel, this oftentimes was what someone that was in fear of their life would do. When Solomon sent the executioners out to Joab, Joab ran to the temple and hid in the temple. Adonijah runs to the temple, grabs a hold of the altar. So, so and this happened in their history. And so this guy, this priest, he's prophesying, I'm, God is telling me they're going to kill you. Let's go hide in the temple. And, and, and Nehemiah's thinking about all this. Well, I thought God wanted me to build a wall, restore Jerusalem. Let's continue to read down to verse number 12. And Nehemiah realizes he, pro, he, he pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this reason he was hired, that I should be afraid and act that way and sin so that they might have cause for an evil report that they may reproach us. See, see the last thing a leader can do is be afraid and run and hide. Leaders are supposed to lead, not cower. This tactic was not only to make him fear, but to recruit Nehemiah's friends to make it appear that he's afraid. Try to discredit him. Nehemiah says, try to approach, reproach me as a leader so I'd run and hide in the temple at the first sight of trouble. So, so they're, they're unloading all these tactics on him, and they've got a fourth one. They try to divide the team. Uh, verse 17. Also, those, uh, also in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came to them, for many in Judah were pledged to him. Tobiah, okay? Also, they, required, they reported his good deeds before me and reported my words to him. Who are the nobles? The nobles were part of his leadership team that he, had, that he had corrected, that he was trying to train for the mission of building the walls and restoring the city. And, and, and so this is part of his leadership team. And, and, and we'll go back to chapters 4 and 5 and find where he's trying to train them to be leaders. And, and so what these nobles are trying to do they're trying to reconcile differences between Nehemiah and Tobiah, but there's a problem. Look at the problem down in verse 19. This is the motive. Tobiah sent letters to frighten me. So gossip going back and forth, letters going back and forth, reports going back and forth with one thing in mind. Let's get Nehemiah. Let's get him afraid Let's get him to run. Tobiah had no intention of reconciling. This was a tactic. His tactic was to divide the leadership team and frighten the team leader. The enemy's tactics, as we're looking at this, is always the same. The enemy's tactic, tactics are to destroy, defame, demoralize, and divide leaders. We have a real enemy. It's a spiritual warfare. He's influencing us. These are his tactics. And sometimes we get sucked in. We don't understand what's going on. The enemy wants to kill the vision, stop the mission, target leaders. So how? With all of this going on, it's overwhelming. How are we supposed to, as leaders, counter the attacks? There's so many. Uh, uh, so multifaceted. How 
can we be able to spiritually counter these multiple tactics and attacks are coming on? Let me give you four and then we'll be done, okay? Number one, we must continue the ministry. Let's go back to verse three. Now, this is after they tried to distract him. So in verse number three, here's what Nehemiah says. So neither I, uh, uh, I'm sorry, so I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave and go down to you? Let, let me put it, let me read the, the Dan Greer version here, okay? The enemy said, why don't you come down and meet with us in Ono? And Nehemiah said, oh no, not going to do it. If I come down to you, stop the, the, the mission, the work will have to stop. The ministry will have to stop. And then it'll take a long time to get it going again. In fact, uh, Nehemiah doubles down. Look down in verse number 40, uh, 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 40, uh, 23. I think I've got the wrong scripture reference here. Neither I, my brethren, my servants, no, the men of the, the guard who followed me took off their clothes, except everyone took them off for wash, washing. As I mentioned earlier, distraction is one of his greatest tactics. When someone tries to distract us from the ministry, we've got to say these two words. Oh, no. I'm doing a work. I'm trying to follow the Lord. I don't want the work to stop. I don't have time. The first thing we've got to do is continue the ministry. The second thing we've got to do is counter the misinformation. I, I, I'm talking about misinformation that defames leadership. Verse number eight. I sent to him saying, now this is where they were trying to defame him, trying to say there's evidence, there's letters, there's testimonials saying that you're trying to start your own kingdom, you're trying to be the king. So, I, so Nehemiah said, I sent to him saying, no such thing as you're saying is done. You, but you invent them in your own heart. For they were all trying to make us afraid. Do you see this constant thing going on here? They're trying to make him afraid. Trying to make him afraid. Their hands will be weak. They're trying to make us afraid saying their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not get done. Now, therefore, oh God, strengthen our hands. So in verses 6 and 7, the, the enemy does something. I emphasized this when I read that earlier. He uses the word you, the, the, the personal pronoun, six times. Implicating accusation. He says, you are rebelling. You are rebuilding. You are recruiting. You can be, so you can be ruling and, it's going, and, and you are going to be reported to the king. So the motive behind implications and accusation is to make him afraid and to stop leading and to stop working. So the only thing that he could do to counter that was to correct the misinformation. Uh-uh. What you're saying is not true. Where did you get your information? Who told that to you? That is absolutely incorrect. Always, when, when uh, you, we, we've got to ask the question, we've got to counter the misinformation. So when our, our enemies use implication, accusation, and information manipulation, which is all just lies, to defame and discredit leaders, we must counter the information with questions. And, and the second thing, and the most important thing that you see there, we must call upon the Lord. Do you see what he did there? He said, and I called upon the Lord for, to strengthen. Oh, God, strengthen me. So we question the misinformation. We call upon the Lord. So how do we counter? We continue the ministry. We counter the misinformation. We challenge the misguided. Verse number 11. And I said, should such a man as I flee, this is when they were saying, let's go, let's run. Let's run. Let's get in the temple. Let's hide. He said, should such a man as I flee, and who is there such as I who would go into the temple and save his life? I will not go in. 
Sometimes close Christian friends will be swayed by the onslaught and thinking they're helping when they're actually hurting. Look at verse 12. Remember, this is, this is Nehemiah's good friend. This is a priest. This is a prophet. This is a guy that he depends on a, a lot. And in verse number 12, it says, Then I perceived that, the God, that God had not seen him, sent him at all, but that, that he pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this reason, uh, for this reason, he was hired that, he should be, that I should be afraid and act that way and sin. He says that, that's sin. So that they might have cause for evil, a re- evil report, that they might reproach me. And this, this is his prayer here. Oh my God, remember Tobias and Ballad, according to those, uh, t- according to those their works, and the prophetess uh, Noadia, and the rest of the prophets who have tried to make me afraid. It'll happen. Misguided friends. Family members begin listening, begin giving, begin giving bad advice. There are two things we do. Challenge the advice, call on the Almighty. And the last thing we must do is complete the mission. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. And it happened when all of our enemies heard of it and all the nations around us saw these things, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that the work was done by God. This leader and his leadership team completed this building program ahead of schedule in less than two months. Can you, can you believe that? Two months. And his enemies went ballistic because he completed the mission. Satan goes ballistic because with the mission completed, the clock starts ticking 483 years. Jesus will be walking through those eastern gates. The mission's complete. While our enemies are distracting and defaming and demoralizing and dividing, we must Continue, counter, challenge, and complete the mission. I've got this book. I love it. It is, if there's a, if there's a great storyteller um, in the pulpit today, it's Chuck Swindoll. Uh, he tells such good stories. He says stories are like the, the windows. Uh, uh, they're illustrations like windows so that you can look in and see the truth. And, and I've got this big book of illustrations that I like to read about him. And he gives an illustration about a, uh, a guy here in South Texas who was driving down a highway. And then all of a sudden, uh, his car veered off the road and into an embankment, and it, and it killed him. And, and so so the car stopped, and, and they began to investigate and ask questions. And some of the people said, well, we saw, we were driving alongside him, and we noticed that just before his car veered off the road, he, he kind of lunged forward and turned to the left, and the car crashed. And so the Emmy got him, took him down, did an autopsy to try to find out what happened. They figured they had a heart attack or a stroke or uh, something sudden, you know. And so, they, so they, they, the medical examiner was looking over his body and noticed a very small puncture wound in the back of his neck. And after examining that puncture wound to see what it was, he discovered that it was the sting of a wasp. That there was a wasp in the back of the car. And as he was driving along, the wasp got its target and came and hit him in the back of the neck and caused so much pain that he lunged forward, lost control of the car, and it caused his death in the accident. Can I say something? I hate wasp. You like them? 
I don't think they're any good. I don't know what good they do. Does anybody know what good a wasp does? I remember as a kid one time playing hide and go seek, and I ran into a hedge. I did not know it, but, but I ran face long into a wasp nest. It was not very pleasant. I hate wasp. I, um, I fight wasp. I get this, this can with a long shooter, and I want to stand very far away, and if they come at me, I'm going to run, okay? Satan is a wasp. He's no good. He targets. He stings. He lives in a colony of demons who are wasp. that swarm. But what's sad is that he recruits Christians to sting. Folks, we're not wasps. So, let me quote, uh, you know, we, we are not to be stinging one another. We're not to be stinging leaders. When wasps come into our present, what we must do is we must continue the mission, the, the, the ministry, counter the misinformation, challenge the misguided, and complete the mission. That's what we do. We're not wasps. We're not supposed to be stinging. So as I close, let me close with two questions. Number one, have you been stung, metaphorically speaking? Has something happened to you that has stung you and that has injured you and you're on the verge of saying no more? Let me ask you something else. Has it been another believer? Has it been someone close? Has it been a friend? If so, you probably want to quit. You probably want to walk away. And that is exactly what Satan wants you to do. So my advice to you is don't quit. Don't give up. Don't walk away. Complete the mission. Stay in the ministry. Don't be afraid of someone coming to sting you. You ready for the second question? That was the first one. Have you been stung? Here's the second one. Have you ever stung a leader? That's a hard one. Are you distracting, defaming, demoralizing, dividing? If so, I've got a word for you. Two words. Ready? Are you ready for these? Stop it! You're not a wasp. You're not an enemy. You've just been misguided. Go to the person. You've been stinging and say, I'm sorry, I just don't know what got over me. Then let's recapture the vision, get back on mission, and let's see the Lord work in our ministry. When we are under attack by a bunch of wasps. We become distressed. We're overwhelmed. We feel like we can't breathe. And we're going to end the service today with that song called Breathe. Because when we look to the Lord, when we counter the tactics, and we look to the Lord in prayer, all of a sudden the burden is lifted, the bomb comes, and we can breathe. On behalf of Pastor Dan and the folks at Community, thank you for joining us today at Community On Demand. Feel free to share this link with others, and please know you are always welcome to be our guest during a live service any Sunday morning at our campus in the Woodlands, Texas. For more information, just click on the link www.cbcwoodlands.org I hope you will again join us at Community On Demand.